So welcome Athena Actrophis and Michael Levin to this episode of the Science of the Noosphere series. Uh, this series is inspired by Pierre Teilhard de Chardin and his concept of the noosphere, which is like the thinking, the mental dimension of humanity, uh, which he said originated as tiny grains of thought with small scale uh, uh, society and then was enlarging to uh, ultimately encompass the entire earth as some kind of global consciousness. And the purpose of the series is to actually place this concept on a solid scientific foundation. And that maps on to a concept that you know well, major evolutionary transitions in individuality. Um, so you might or might not know uh, much about Teilhard, but you know a lot about major transitions. And we'll be focusing on, on the single cell and multicellularity as, um, as uh, those particular transitions. Well, let's begin just by, uh, uh, first of all, having you introduce yourself as people, how you wandered into this kind of work, and, um, and how you encountered the work of Teilhard, if at all. So Athena, why don't you begin, and then we'll pass to Michael. Well, so for me, I've been just fascinated by the idea of major transitions, really from the time that I was in my late teens. So this notion that, you know, you have levels of organization that where you get sort of regulation of cooperation, and then that allows you to build additional levels and additional levels um, has, has been really a foundation of my thinking from the very beginning. Um, so the, the notion that, you know, there is this sort of layer of, um, sort of collective cognition that's happening in humanity. To me, it's a reflection of the fact that, you know, on sort of all of these different levels, you have computation and information processing happening in surprising places. And sometimes it's decentralized, sometimes it's more centralized, um, but you, you do have this sort of unexpected um, prevalence of information processing happening everywhere. Yeah, totally. Michael, how about you? Yeah, um, well, I guess uh, all of my work uh, probably uh, stems from two uh, kind of foundational um, experiences that I had as a kid. And one of those was uh, looking inside the back of a TV set. This is like one of those giant old school TV sets with the vacuum tubes and uh, thinking about the process that led to somebody knowing how to put all those things in there at just the right, you know, in just the right configuration to have something interesting happen. And conversely, uh, playing with bugs and insects outdoors and, and asking the basically the same question, right, is that, you know, now you've got a different type of uh, of creature that probably has some sort of internal perspective and, and goals and, and preferences and so on. And just asking these uh, really fundamental questions about what it means to have some sort of a body that is made up of parts, but nevertheless it has a kind of a centralized, um, you know, is, is, is the subject of, of, of collective memories and preferences and, and goals and so on. Um, yeah, and so, so my background is originally computer science. I got a degree, uh, an undergrad degree in computer science, trying to uh, work in, in artificial intelligence and then uh, did biology, uh, hoping to really understand the decisions that cellular collectives make as a kind of, um, you know, morphogenetic process, view, viewing morphogenesis as, a, as the behavior of a collective intelligence. Michael, while, while you were staring at the back of the TV screen, I was staring at the front of the TV screen. When I was like four, I was absolutely... <laughs> <laughs> like most people, like most people. <laughs> yeah, well, there were two things I was obsessed with. The first one was that movie um, Annie because it was like just the best musical, amazing choreography. And the other was the Nova special about morphogenesis. I had watched that over and over and over again. And I think like that's really like where my fascination with like emergence and multicellularity really started was just like watching that over and over. And I was like asking my parents, like, how does it do that? And, you know, they sort of like gave me like vague answers. Well, it's like chemical gradients and gene expression. And I was like, but how, how does it know to do that? So, so yeah, d definitely spent many, many hours when, when I was four watching that over and over and over. So one memorable thing that Teilhard said was that, uh, although in some respects, um, uh, we are just another ape species, a little different than other apes. In other respects, we're a new evolutionary process, cultural evolution, and that makes the origin of our species as significant in its own way as the origin of life. And to take that seriously, 
requires actually knowing a lot about the origin of life and biological levels of organization in order to compare human levels of organization. And when we get to the single cell, many people have thought that that's relatively simple, that the history of life has been one of increasing complexification. And I think that uh, one of the, um, where your work stands out is in demonstrating that no, no, I mean, the complexity of a single cell and the first multicellular organisms is absolutely amazing. So life itself in its first forms has an extraordinary form of, of, of complexity, including a form of mentality, a form of mentality, and even a form of group level mentality. So a lot that's associated with the noosphere in humans it, uh, can be understood at the very initial stages of life. And so I've stated this um, very crudely, you guys are the experts. And Michael, why don't you begin just kind of elaborating on, on that theme, the complexity of the single cell, and then Athena um, uh, uh, take over. So Michael. Yeah, so, so maybe I'll just uh, sketch a little bit how I tend to think about these things. So one thing that uh, I'm interested in is uh, trying to come up with a framework that is able to handle in a, um, in a in a very practical way in terms of empirically driving research and so on, truly diverse intelligences. And so, so I'm interested in what is the invariant between all intelligent things, no matter what their um, embodiment is, no matter what their provenance is, evolved, designed, exobiological, artificial, whatever. And so in doing that, um, and this is, this is a, t a framework I've called TAME, T-A-M-E, for technological approach to mind everywhere. Um, what, what I take to be central about intelligence is problem solving in some particular space. And in particular, uh, this idea that, that we recognize agents or selves or individuals, and we can compare them, no matter what they're made of or how they got here, by the scale of goals that they can pursue. So, so to me, the fundamental... Uh, building block of all of this is some sort of goal directedness. And it can be as humble as a homeostatic loop keeping a metabolic state, which, you know, even, even bacteria can do, or it can be very large scale things. And so the spatiotemporal scale of the goals that you are capable of pursuing, right? And, and so maybe very small in case of a microbe, you know, local concentration of sugar or something, or it could be very large in the case of, of humans. And we could talk about the transition to the very special transition to humans in terms of uh, the goals that they can uh, pursue uh, is, is, is what to me is, is central. And so when you look at it that way, uh, in fact, we, we see evolution as a, pr a process that can scale, uh, that can scale cognitive uh, selves from, from very humble local goals to large scale goals, first like making an organ, making a whole body, and then of course behavioral goals in, in three dimensional space. And uh, we see a very smooth process of, um, of scaling these goals throughout um, throughout evolution, and so I see bodies as um, these these overlapping nested communities of selves with local goals in various spaces. So in physiological space, and transcriptional space, and metabolic space, of course, anatomical morphospace. So to me, morphogenesis, like developmental uh, morphogenesis, regeneration, those kinds of things, are the process of the collective intelligence of cells. Um, operating in morphospace, in the anatomical morphospace. So I think, yeah, I think, I think uh, intelligence de defined operationally in that way goes all the way back to the beginning. And what we see is it's scaling uh, through, through evolution. Michael, I'm curious, you know, just listening to you talk about this idea of like the sort of nested goals, I can't help but think about, you know, human groups and the, the challenges of sort of getting lots of people on the same page with goals, um, or even if people have the same goals, getting them all pointed in the right direction at the same time, almost like, you know, thinking of like a organ trying to develop, right? It's like, it's not enough for them to all have the same, you know, DNA, everything, everyone has to be in the same expression state or in the right expression state, right, in order to accomplish a shared goal. So, so like, when you think about humans having goals together, do these same principles apply? Or are there things that sort of change when you go to the level of, of thinking about humans? 
Yeah, very, yeah, very interesting question. So, so I think I think looking for scale-free principles that might carry over from from subcellular networks through cells to human societies, um, collectives, you know, ants and and bees and, and these kinds of things is is very important. I think that I mean I, I'm I'm in no way an expert on so, you know societies and, and and you know kind of human activities, um, but. Uh, I think we can see something very interesting happen in, in the cellular case. And I think the cellular case is very instructive for how this scaling happens. And I think, I think actually I'm really looking forward to talking to you about the cancer aspects of this because I think it's actually very um, foundational there. What will happen is, um, and this is, this is what we've observed, is that you have um, individual cells which are themselves competent in their local spaces. So they solve transcriptional problems, physiological problems, basically homeostatic units. They're trying to keep certain things in, in parameter. Their evolution discovered a really interesting uh, thing fairly early on, which is which which we call a gap junction. This is a um, an electrical synapse, and the thing that's magical about these gap junctions is that uh, unlike if if you imagine traditional signaling, extracellular, you know, secreted, I secrete some sort of chemical and it goes over and hits this other cell. When you have two cells, one signaling to the other, because these signals come from the outside. The recipient cell knows very clearly that these generated that these originated from the outside. So it can ignore them, it can do something about them, it can remember them, whatever. When two cells couple to each other with these gap junctions, what happens is that these signals propagate to some extent directly into the intercellular milieu from one cell to another. And what happens then is because these signals don't have any kind of metadata on them that says where did they come from, they, they, the ownership information is wiped. So that when you have two cells that are tightly coupled by gap junctions, one cell, let's say, gets injured or has some new experience, it generates a calcium spike that uh, appears in the other cell. That second cell cannot tell whether this is its own memory or some other memory of some other creature. Basically, this connection by, by wiping ownership information, that kind of connection creates an almost mind meld where you can't tell where your memories end and some other memories begin. And when this happens in a large network, you end up you end up making these electrical networks that can that have the computational capacity to measure, remember, and uh, and store goal states that are huge ones that a single cell couldn't possibly um, you know. We're talking bacteria here, just to let everyone know. So uh, I mean, you've uh, some of what I've written uh, I've read of yours, uh, Michael, talks about biofilms basically, bacterial biofilms as as superorganisms. So, you know, among the superorganisms, we all know about the you social insects, but now we have these microbial uh, uh, biofilms, which which really do qualify as superorganisms, complete with the analog of nervous systems. So, talk to us about about um, that, just to nail down this idea that 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 um, of, of the, the complexity of before we even get to nucleated cells of uh, bacterial uh, biofilms. Tell us some stories about that. There's some uh, some beautiful work from from. Um... UCSD looking at uh, electrical signaling in bacterial biofilms as very brain-like. And I think that's been, and this isn't our work, and this is, uh, I think, because evolution discovered very early on that electrical networks are a great way to, uh, to, to scale and propagate and coordinate information, to store memories. They're just very convenient. It's no accident that the nervous system uses them, that we use them for um, computer technology. But, but you know, in, in, in the body, what happens is that these, these networks are now capable of storing um, much larger uh, types of um, goal state information and and the individuality of the of, of the of the components is is wiped to and and you know sort of erased to an important extent because now these you have memories you have goals and um, activities that are a property of the collective that individual the individuals couldn't do and so just to get back to Athena's comment about the the, the humanity I think one you know from the perspective of uh, coordinating morphogenesis and avoiding cancer, these kinds of these kind of gap junctional connections are really critical. And one might be tempted to say, look, the way to scale goals and make sure that everybody's on the same goal is to sort of um, mind meld us all into this uh, into this larger scale network where where all of this can take place. But I, I think we have to be very careful about that because you know when was the last time you were you were too concerned about what happened to your individual skin cells? Right, we shed them all the time. We don't really worry about it. You know, you might go rock climbing or something and tear a bunch of skin off your hands and you feel good because hey, I went rock climbing. The individual cells may not be happy about that at all. And so there's there's presumably there's some sort of optimal 
uh, linkage mechanisms to be found that allow us to reap the benefits of, of a larger um, collective IQ while at the same time um, holding on to uh, the, 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 the um, respect for the, for the goals and the needs of the, you know, the individual pieces that go in there. We'll, we'll return to that later on, but, but uh, Athena, back to you. Oh yeah, just you know, hearing you talk about the gap junctions, it it just sounds it sounds just like you know you've got someone under your skin, or like you care, you have a lot of empathy, and so you can't help but you know feel the feelings when you see someone else feeling them, right? And um, it's fascinating to then think about you know, well, you, we do have sort of different problems that we have to solve as human groups and different constraints, right? If you know, we're not all genetically homogeneous. There's possibilities for cheating that have to be regulated in a much tighter way than you have in a multicellular body. So, so anyway, David, I'll, I'll stop because I know you want to, you know, bring the conversation back around to the stuff later, but I think it's a really, it's a really rich um, area to kind of explore some of the, the similarities at these different scales. Yeah, totally. And, and we don't have to wait. I mean, large scale society has a lot of the same characters, especially the, the, the concept of the invisible hand is, is that individuals can kind of be operating locally, maximizing their local utilities, and somehow it works out for the benefit of the common good, and the individual does not have to have the common good in mind. What would that be but like a liver cell operating according to its local um, environment, but nevertheless the whole thing coordinated so that the common good um, is, is benefit? Well, I think the question is, you know, are the rules that the individual is operating by, whether they're a human or a liver cell, you know, have those kind of been designed and calibrated for higher level function or not, right? And so for, you know, a liver cell, yeah, they kind of have been designed and calibrated for that higher level function. But in the case of humans, there's a there's conflicting goals, you know, there's some that are for higher level function, and then there's others that are for more individual level. And so sort of negotiating that, I think, is uh, one of the big challenges of, you know, applying some of these principles from, you know, multicellularity and regulation of multicellular bodies to large scale human systems. Yeah, totally. Just to, to, go ahead, Marco. Well, I, I was just going to say, I, th I think this is this is a really interesting question about um, being calibrated to to specific goals, because uh, one of the things that we've been working on, and, and of course, other people had as well in the past, is um the 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 diversity of things that uh, that the of behaviors that can be executed by cells with exactly the same genome and so in in you know right and and the plasticity with which uh, cells of any given genome can solve problems in novel environments that they haven't seen before and so one of my favorite recent examples is this um is this thing we've been doing that we call xenobots which is uh, these are these are novel proto-organisms that never existed on Earth before. That basically what we do is we take skin cells off of a frog embryo, and uh, we 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 don't add anything. We don't edit the genome. We don't add any um, novel transgenes or or um, nanomaterials or anything like that. But we we take away something. We take away the other cells that are normally uh, instructing and constraining these cells to to have this boring sort of two-dimensional life on the surface of the of the animal. And we we put them in a new environment and we let them. Uh, reboot their multicellularity. We let them. We, we ask them, in, in effect, what, what, in the absence of these other cues, what do you, you know, what do you want to do? What is your default behavior? And we find out that actually, they self-organize. There's many things they could have done, but in fact, they self-organize into this novel uh, shape with novel behaviors, novel, um, novel uh, capabilities, with, uh, with, with uh, self-directed behavior. In fact, that um, raises some really interesting questions about what did evolution actually do when it developed the frog genome because being an excellent frog is one thing it did but that's not the only thing it did in some way the the, the exact same hardware in a novel environment is able to now um, follow different uh, different kinds of goals including figure out a novel way to reproduce itself they reproduce by kinematic replication instead of the normal sort of froggy reproduction way which we've made impossible um, and so I, I think there are some really profound uh, gaps in our understanding of what are things actually, you know, sort of optimized for, right? Because there's, there's a tremendous amount of, of freedom and creativity when you release some of these constraints. You find out that there's actually, you know, this agential material that evolution has to work with these cells that if you do nothing, they're going to do things on their own. You, you know, all, the best you're going to do is, is sort of um, guide them to, to, to various adaptive uh, outcomes. I, I think that's a very interesting set of questions. Michael, do you ever yeah. feel like a mad scientist sitting there? You're like, I wonder what these cells will do if I take them out of the frog. And 
<laughs> Put them constantly, in the new environment. Constantly. That, yeah, that's my, my, that's my preferred yeah. state of mind. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> well, didn't you get uh, an eye to develop within the gut of a tadpole or something like that, I think? That, uh, that's, that, uh, that's, exactly, that's exactly right, and, and, and we should talk about that. Yeah, we've been, um, we've been playing with uh, understanding the, uh, the, the, the sort of cognitive medium that holds the, that holds the, the, the patterns to which this, these collective intelligences build, and not, not terribly surprising, it's bioelectrical. It's like a non-neural version of neuroscience, basically. And in certain cases, we've learned to read and write that electrical information, and so we can, we can sort of overwrite the native pattern memories that these things have. And then you can go to a different set group of cells in the frog that are otherwise going to make gut, and you can say to them, you should really be making an eye. And in fact, that's what they do. They'll, they'll, they'll make an eye. And in fact, what we found is that when you place these eyes, even on the tails of tadpoles, those animals can see perfectly well. So the, the, the eye cells will form even though they're sitting. Yeah, yeah, they'll form even though they're sitting in the middle of muscle instead of in their normal place near the brain. They, they form a nice eye. They make an optic nerve. The optic nerve runs around and, and, and looks what to connect with, doesn't find the brain, sometimes finds the spinal cord. So it'll connect to the spinal cord. Those animals, when they don't have any primary eyes, just one eye sitting on their tail, we can train them for visual cues. So we've got, we built this machine that trains them to, you know, from, stay away from a certain kind of light. They can see perfectly well. So are they evolving like for some evolvability in a way that like, like other organisms aren't? Is there like, you think there's big variation maybe in this? Like some organisms just have like the ability to have like change up their plans or their body plans, you know, when cha things change? Per personally, uh, now, now obviously we haven't done this in every organism, but, but I have some examples in other models where I, I don't think this is special. I think this is a fundamental feature of life. And I'll tell you, I'll tell you why. Uh, the, the amazing thing about that kind of, um, and, and I call this whole, this whole business multi-scale competency, because what it means is that, that evolution can do as a process is rely on the various subcomponents to get their job done, even when circumstances change. So what it means is that if, if we're using an architecture where it's not, nothing is hard, really hard, well, except for you know, metabolic things, but, but things aren't really hardwired. Every, what you're doing is you're, you've got modules that are going to try to get their goals done, meaning homeostatically, they're going to try to achieve their, um, their objectives, their agendas, uh, as, as Dan Dennett calls it, uh, despite the fact that their circumstances change. This really potentiates evolution. It smooths the fitness landscape because it means that if you've got some mutation that moves the eye to the wrong location, but it does something good somewhere else in the embryo, you don't have to wait until you find that, you know, you, 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 you find that second mutation without disturbing the eye. It's fine. The eye will do its job. In the tadpole, we show that craniofacial organs, if you start them off in the wrong position, we call them Picasso tadpoles, they will still move around in these novel paths and give you a perfectly good frog during metamorphosis. It doesn't matter that they're out of kilter early on. And so this means that, that evolution can really explore all kinds of things without immediately uh, incurring the penalty of just wrecking the whole thing. The, the minute you move something, just everything is wrecked. So when you look at this in all kinds of species, right? I mean, human embryos, you can cut them in half and you get two perfectly normal monozygotic twins because it's incredibly plastic. Half the embryo realizes that the other half is missing, regenerates what's, re what's, what's needed, and, and you know, you're good to go. There's tons of these beautiful examples of plasticity and problem solving of, of this kind of um, competency. I, I think it's everywhere. I think it's what makes evolution um, you know, um, workable, basically. One of the threads, then, that goes between your and my work is this idea of beautiful monsters. So... You know, I, I've thought about it in terms of like uh, the crested cacti that, you know, they have like this cancer like form. They're like beautiful in the, you know, patterning that results. And um, I mean, your version is maybe a little more mad science-y, but. Um, su super interesting point, because, uh, for, you know, what, the, understanding what a monster is and understanding what a birth defect is. Right. I mean, chem chemistry doesn't make mistakes, but by but biology, if you're going to say it's a mistake, it's or, or an error or a developmental defect in some way, it's with reference to a, an expectation that was supposed to happen. And one of the interesting things that we see now is that these these sort of um, uh, attractors and morphous spaces, different ways of forming um, um, uh, bodies, you can, you know, we can take a planarian flatworm and you, and, and you cut off the head. They, of course, regrow the head. Normally, 100% of the time, they regrow ahead of the correct species. What we can do is perturb the electrical conversations between cells that help them remember what head shape they're supposed to make. 
And as a result, they will stochastically make heads that belong to other species of planaria. So there you have a complete mismatch between the genetics. The genetics is unaltered. You've still got the same wild type genome, but the cells will land in a different attractor in morphospace. space. They'll make a head with a brain shape with a stem cell distribution looking like um, planaria that are 150 million years distant, right? And so from, from the exact same genome. And so this idea of, 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 of what a monster is, and we can make um, tadpoles that have zebrafish-like tails and the faces looking like other frogs and so on. And so this is, yeah, this is all, you know, speciation versus, versus developmental defect. I, th I think you're, you're exactly right. It's very interesting. So basically, you know, the raw material that evolution is working with is, is much more agential than most people uh, uh, think. These lower level units are organized into modules within other modules and they're coordinated so that, um, so that, um, and that results in this just tremendous diversity that you could, if you know the mechanisms, then you could create these, these monsters. So this provides a good way for us to introduce. So there's that. That's kind of like on the variation part of a variation selection replication uh, process. And we can all along we've been talking about the importance of levels of selection. That this this amazing diversity that arises um, has to pass the survival test, basically the survival and reproduction test. And so the selection at the level of the individual organism is now winnowing these. That's what distinguishes a, mon a monster from anything else is whether it can survive or, or reproduce. And so higher level selection is, is then operating on this amazing diversity that, that arises in this like coordinated fashion because of these agents basically in these homeostatic units and and all of that, and and right away we could map that onto, uh, back onto, uh, uh, humans, and the idea that uh, that uh, individuals are, you know, like these lower level units, they're tremendously generative, they're doing all of these things, but that's going to result in the social manifestation, which might work well or poorly, and unless you have selection at that level, basically, then you'll get monsters, you'll get as opposed to. Um, uh, uh, social organizations that actually function well in the context of their environment. So these are all, you know, I mean, real parallelisms between between this biological level of organization and and what takes place in humans. David, I have to say, I have a, a certain fondness for monsters, though, monsters of all kinds. I think, uh, you know, oftentimes they do, like, hold these keys to understanding what like what mechanisms are sometimes they have new solutions embedded within them even though uh, at first they look like there's something that's non-functional so um yeah and even in human organizations i mean sometimes yeah they're really messed up and weird but sometimes you get really interesting things coming out of completely you know seemingly dysfunctional ways that humans relate so i um yeah so i i'm not going to completely dismiss monsters because they, they do have a, a special place in my heart. And it's not just because of the zombie thing, David. It's not just the zombie thing. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, we're, we're coming up. This is like the second or third time we've come up against a, a problem which surfaces throughout this series is that there's forms of superorganisms not worth wanting. There's forms of superorganisms that are downright scary. We don't want societies that treat us like skin cells. Thank you very much. We don't want societies that basically make that kind of valuation so that if you're not the right type, then then you're devalued, which I think. So if you're a, a monster, um, then for some reason, then you're going to be discarded by by that um, by that society. We want we want something, as did Tehard, that that respects individual freedom and dignity and and and. Um, and autonomy. And so there's real kind of moral tensions here when we talk about group level organisms, as do the kinds which exist and the kinds which we want for ourselves. And among the dystopias that we could consider, first of all, it collapses so that there's no functional organization at all. Or things that work very well, thank you very much, but, but in a way which is just horrifying as far as um, I respect for individuals are concerned. And they all could happen. They could happen. It's like threading the needle as to the kind of superorganism we want uh, um, is, um, or we think is worth wanting. So this is very fraught with, with tensions. 
Yeah, a civilization that was based on the principles of multicellularity would be a absolutely terrifying authoritarian government. So we don't want that. <laughs> Interesting to see how this maybe translates back into cellular interactions as we find our way towards uh, discussing multicellularity and and um, uh, and such things as uh, uh, cancers. Is that there's a reason why human society needs to be egalitarian. And that reason is most evident in small groups because in the segments, in the episodes that focus on human evolution, it's all about cooperation and cooperation is all about preventing uh, social control, uh, preventing bullying behaviors. The, the one danger in, in, in human social groups was the danger of being bullied, of being pushed around. And the only reason that small human groups cooperate is because they have the wherewithal to collectively gang up against bullies. And unless individuals are capable of standing up for themselves, then they will be bullied. And so, so this requires a kind of an egalitarianism, which exists in most small scale uh, societies. And that egalitarianism needs to be retained as the scale of society increases. If it's not, then we get despotism. That's what we get. So uh, the optimistic message, as I like to see it, is that uh, thanks to the fact that we're not genetically highly related to the other people in our societies, the only way for us to operate as a unit is with various forms of egalitarian uh, uh, forms of, um, of social control, like the rules of meiosis, for example, as a biological Example: Every every gene has a fair chance of making it to the next generation, and if it and if you don't have that, you have meiotic drive, and then the organism ceases to to um, uh, to function. Even that is probably a result of a huge um, like multi-layer regulation system that keeps meiotic drive from getting out of control. Because I mean, that's such a weak point in you know the the transmission so so yeah i mean i think that there's you know there are many there are many phenomena in biology where it's kind of just been assumed that like oh this problem is solved but really underlying that are all of these layers multiple layers and checks and balances of regulation that that can break and that also if we don't you know appreciate that it works because we have those layers of regulation then we kind of you know we're we just assume that uh you know, the problem of cooperation is solved just by virtue of like genetic relatedness, which I think is like a, a problem that is, um, or that assumption is, is quite widespread in the evolution and behavior community, almost like, oh, you're, you're genetically identical, so there's not a problem. It's like, well, no, there's still, you know, you could still have all these issues of cheating and exploitation unless there was selection that acted to create these regulatory mechanisms on this higher level. And the whole vocabulary of human social control has been transported. We have parliaments of genes, we have policing, we have sheriff genes, we have, <clears throat> and so the whole vocabulary of human uh, collective action and social control is now part of the parlance of people who work on that. So Michael, you were about to say something. Two quick things, one, one is that, um, yeah, the, the the solving this problem by genetic relatedness is uh, is is really interesting because on the one hand we have situations where even in the same body during embryonic development all, all kinds of competition takes place. So and in fact it's 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 necessary for coordination. Cells and tissues compete for informational signals. They compete for metabolic resources, and it's actually really critical to make sure that um, overall development goes goes correctly. And conversely, you know, we make hybrids. We can make um, chimeras of cells of very distant origin, and they will cooperate. Life is incredibly interoperable. The cells will cooperate with electronic devices. They will cooperate with other cells that belong to a completely different type of type of animal. And they will build something. You know, we we make uh, frog alotls that are fifty percent frog and let's say fifty percent axolotl, right? And they make something. Um, these cells have no problem cooperating with each other, even though they're uh, quite quite you know distinct genetics. And I think w with with um, this issue of uh, of of what kind of societies we want and everything uh, of that nature, it's it's important to realize how limited w w our view is in our ability to detect agency that uh, that is impacting us. And what I mean by this is that you know 
we are very good at, as most animals are, at detecting agency outside of us in the three-dimensional world. So all our senses point outwards. We look around and we say, okay, that is a rock, but that is, a, you know, a tiger or, or prey or whatever it's going to be. And we can recognize that. Imagine if we had, if we grew up with a kind of a sense that was biofeedback, if you knew at every given point what your pancreas was doing, I think we would have no trouble recognizing it as an intelligent agent solving problems if we had access to the space that it works in, the actions that it takes when things, you know, if we could, if we could see it working in physiological space, the way that we see animals running around in three-dimensional space, we would have a much better appreciation for what, uh, you know, that intelligent looks, intelligence looks like. And so that's sort of going downwards, but also going upwards. Um, I think that uh, it would be, it would be a, you know, kind of a Lovecraftian scale of, of, of horror if a single cell could realize that, my God, I'm part of this organism, and everything, you know, the, the actions that I take in my space have been completely bent by that space has been just distorted, you know, in the in the relativity sense that that space has been distorted by the needs of this larger system of which the matrix, Michael, it's the matrix. <laughs> right. I mean, it would be it would be incredible. And, and of course, of course, by by definition, these parts don't have the wherewithal to understand what the goals are in for, to, to which their space is distorted. But, you know, I often wonder, are there any tools of information theory of, of something that would allow you to at least, you know, have some idea that you're part of this larger scheme that that is just, you know, is, is distorting your, your options in, in some way. I think uh, we're, we're very bad at, at recognizing that intrinsically. I mean, Michael, isn't that what we're all living in? A, a human society where, you know, we are shaped by the goals of others and the incentives that are around us and like, you know, our whole reality, especially if, you know, we live in a city and we, you know, go to a workplace where we're, you know, around other people, like so much of our world is created by other humans and that shapes what we can and can't do and what the, you know, um, outcomes are for different courses of action that we might take. Yeah, but but there's an even extra, I mean, that's absolutely true, but, but there's an even extra layer. Imagine, imagine for a moment that you were... Um, shrunk down to the size of a single cell, and you didn't know about embryonic development. You were placed inside of an early embryo, frog, fish, human, doesn't matter. You and, and you looked around, right? And you saw this incredible activity. Cells are dying, cells are randomly falling off, other stuff is happening, there's lots of noise, all, all this. Y you could easily tell that your uh, um, options were um, impacted by what your neighbors were doing, that there were signals. So you would for sure know that you're impacted in exactly the way that you would say. What I think you wouldn't necessarily know if you didn't already understand what embryonic development was, I don't think you'd have a clue that all of this giant uh, rigmarole, you know, this, this process with its noise and everything else is going to reliably crank out a zebrafish every single time. I don't think you would catch that at all. And I think we take this for granted when we say, yeah, you know, the acorns make oak trees. Yeah, that's how it's supposed to be. But, but, but we know that because we've seen it happen. We, we have zero capability right now to predict that. You know, developmental biology, if, if, you were, if you were shrunk down to a local perspective and seeing all the stuff that was going on, would you be able to tell that this is all part of making a zebrafish? I don't think you would. And so, so that, that extra step going from knowing that, yes, you are constrained by these million things and that, you know, no doubt a, a lot of things are affecting what you're going to be able to do to the next step of saying, my God, I'm part of something that actually has a goal state. It will reliably reach this and have some ability to comprehend it to whatever extent our intellect allows, right? This speaks to the unintended component, the blind component of human cultural evolution, where cultures work without anyone knowing how they work to some extent. I mean, and I, it's the intentional and the unintended, the blind and intentional components of, of cultural evolution, human cultural evolution, is the quintessential glass half full. It's hard to know what to be more impressed by. The blind component, which leads to design that nobody that nobody designed, or the intentional component where people actually sit around, set about with their social arrangements and succeeded to a degree at, at, at accomplishing what they intended to build. I mean, there's, there's excellent examples of both, but um, to focus on the blind component, then it results in exactly what you're saying, Michael. We're all participants in something that actually does result in order to a degree. And we're completely unaware of it because we didn't design it. It's just what survived and what what hang, what hung together compared to the many things that fall apart. So, and then it's up to us as scientists to uh, to understand that, just the way with any other thing, where instrumentation and 
and and theorizing is required to to uh, to apprehend what we what we had no idea of and had no way of knowing, couldn't possibly have known if we didn't actually apprehend it scientifically. So, so uh, you know, before we can barrel on, <laughs> um, um, I want to go back to the symbiotic cell theory, but which has been covered in other. Um, episodes, but the idea that the uh, the nucleated cells, eukaryotic cells, evolved as symbiotic communities of bacterial cells, um, thus documented for mitochondria and chloroplasts. Uh, but there's also a question as to whether any other aspects of of um, eukaryotic cell structure, such as flagella or, or other organelles, also have um, separate origins. And um, uh, I don't know uh, either one of you if you're if you have opinions on that, but just dwell a little bit on on uh, the symbiotic cell theory associated with Lynn Margulis as we're talking at the cellular level. Well, I think that the evidence is quite convincing, and to me, one of the really fascinating pieces of it is this idea that. Um, Almost, you know, because you built a eukaryotic cell out of these two elements that um, where there was some level of conflict, you know, I mean, there's kind of still is like you could see in the way the genomes are, you know, interact with each other, that there's some level of conflict that you actually had a, a very efficient mechanism for cell death. Um, one that you could kind of turn on a dime, because I think it's hard to build into um, a cooperative system this ability to self-destruct if things are, you know, kind of getting out of hand. But by actually introducing, um, you know, genes where there was sort of conflict, um, I think that might have actually been a really important piece of allowing for um, this cell death program, you know, the apoptosis program to, um, to be built in at this, you know, most fundamental level. Um, so then you could actually build much larger bodies because you kind of have um, this like quick switch, like a kill switch for cells that are um, misbehaving. Um, and I think it might have otherwise actually been too sort of challenging to get into um, that kind of space evolutionarily, where you where you'd have a a really solid sort of kill switch built into each cell, you know, to like get something else in there that, you know, previously evolved to try to kill the cell, put it in there under regulatory control. And then um, I think that might have actually allowed for much larger and more complex organization than was possible before. I think one of the, the um, upcoming um, fields that's going to have a lot of interesting things to say about that is uh, this the, is, is, is bioengineering and chimerism. Because we are now putting things into cells that have never been there before and so on. And both at the cell and tissue level, people make um, uh, cyborgs and hybrots and all these different kinds of uh, mixes of, of, uh, of, of cellular material and, and subcellular material and designed, uh, engineered artifacts and so on. And what you see is this incredible uh, kind of ability to, to um, adapt and work with whatever's there. And I think it, it would surprise me not at all that, that, uh, that, that early events in evolution would, would combine all these different things because we see cells making use of stuff that, uh, that is just incredibly alien to them and, and no problem. They figure out how to get along with all these weird materials and so on. And so there's this, there's this huge uh, area of, of uh, synthetic biology and bioengineering where we're giving cells novel metabolic capabilities, novel signal capabilities, novel computational capabilities, biomechanical capabilities, uh, and, uh, and all of this is, is highly interoperable. And so that, that plasticity of, of being able to work with whatever you've encountered, if you can make some sort of use out of it, I think, uh, you know, I wouldn't be surprised at all. Let's uh, make cancer center stage here. Um, and uh, why is cancer a fundamental problem of multicellular uh, Organisms. Uh, Athena, why don't you go first, and then, uh, and then, um, and then Michael. Sure. Yeah. So, cancer is a problem because multicellularity is fundamentally a cooperative system of cells. So, you know, in order to make this transition from unicellular life or sort of you know aggregates of cells that were just sort of operating together um, to like a truly multicellular structure and method of reproducing there had to be some mechanisms in there that kept um, cells from 
replicating and monopolizing the resources um, in a way that would limit the ability of that organism to function. You know, just like a cooperative group can be totally taken down by one exploiter, um, same thing with a group of cells. If there's one cell in there that's replicating out of control or monopolizing all the resources and, you know, creating waste products, like that can make it not viable to have a cellular group. So the evolution of multicellularity itself would not have really been possible without checks and balances um, on, you know, these potential ways that cells might cheat. You know, I, I mentioned replicating too much, um, monopolizing resources, creating lots of waste products, um, sort of not participating in the um, creation and maintenance of the, ex the extracellular environment. That's actually a, a really important piece as well. Um, and uh, apoptosis also, so this controlled cell death, you know, when the cell is, um, if it's infected or if it's mutated, or if just developmentally um, it makes sense for those cells to fall away, um, if, if there isn't a mechanism for apoptosis that's reliable, and that's kind of, you know, going back to the earlier part of the conversation about like how important that, that it is to have a really, really fail-proof apoptosis mechanism, um, you know, those are those are just necessary pieces to have um, multicellular function. And so really built into multicellularity is this vulnerability to cancer, but also all of these regulatory mechanisms that help to suppress it. Yeah, just I wanted to emphasize one thing you said. On the one hand, we have cheating. And on the other hand, we have just the coordination that's required to build an organism, even if everyone is willing and you said, you know, need to fall away, I think, is one of the things that you said, that just in the process of building an organism, it's a need for there to be competition, as Michael has stressed, and for there to be cell death, even before we get to cheating, just uh, just because that's the way the, the organism is is um, is um, is molded. So there's co-op, there's there's coordination. And then there's cheating. And a lot of what you were saying about such things as cell death and so on. Um, would need to take place uh, just for the coordination uh, part of it, that uh, cells have to die under some circumstances in order to build, uh, build the organism. So, uh, so uh, uh, Michael, why don't you uh, uh, take your turn on this? Yeah. Um, I, so, so I'll start with the cheating portion and then tell a, a little, uh, you know, kind of our story of, of cancer and, and, and the lens through which I see this, this process. Um, uh, let, let's go back to this, this idea of, of cells being joined by these, by these uh, gap junctions. Uh, one of the things that it does is it, is it greatly increases cooperation because when your internal environment is directly connected to the internal environment of your neighbor, the, there's no cheating possible because you would be anything you do is immediately anything your neighbor does is felt by you anything you do is felt by your neighbor it's like a it's like an effective sort of karma system that that there's no cheating because you are not distinct anymore you are in many ways you have ceased to be and now there's this new greater you you know greater um kind of entity that you'd be cheating yourself in effect if you if you you know poisoned it or something like that so so the thing so, so I'll tell this this uh, kind of story um of, of, how, of how we see we see cancer. I mean, so 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 I completely agree with Athena. It's it's a fundamental uh, uh, aspect of being multicellular and having this need for for cooperation. So one thing that happens when you've got cells that particularly join into these electrical networks is that these electrical networks are just for free from from physics are subject to spontaneous symmetry breaking and the organization of patterns that serve as large scale homeostatic states where now your homeostatic state is a pattern it's a spatial arrangement not a local metabolic state so this this facilitates um, certain kinds of morphogenesis because downstream they control the you know, gene expression and cell movement and all that but um, one of the one of the things that happens is that is that they start working on so so if you if you in your in your mind and, and we've you know we sort we sort of have some tools for doing this if you visualize the scale of the self that is formed here you start out with a single cell and you'd say okay the scale in, in terms of a spatiotemporal um, cognitive uh, radius you know this 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 kind of um, light cone that that limits what you can work towards you know there's some metabolic goals and you have a little bit of memory going back a little bit of predictive capacity going forward once you're this network and you have this this much larger um, kinds of the, these larger goals that you can work on we're going to make a liver or we're going to make a heart or, or, or whatever because that's what this this uh, network is able to uh, is able to do uh, what happens is that 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 the, that boundary of the self scales 
so that what happens is it, it, it goes up so that now everybody's sort of cooperating on to, on this uh, on this on this one one project and when that process is screwed up and of course one of the first uh, one of the first steps of, of conversion, you know, when, when, when you start to convert to cancel, one of the first things that happens is gap junctions close, right? Your gap junctions close, you lose electrical connectivity. As soon as you've lost electrical connectivity, your, uh, your, that boundary between self and, and outside environment shrinks because now that cell, as far as it's concerned, everything it sees around itself, that's just the external environment as far as it's concerned, right? It can go back to being an amoeba because now it's now it's it's now uh, I, the, the boundary between me and everybody else is very tiny. So I would say that these cells are not any more selfish than anything else. It's just their selves have shrunk. Everybody's selfish is just before yourself was kind of huge and everybody was working towards it. Now yourself is tiny and now you're back to your goals from from those ancient days where what are my goals, right? Each amoeba, you know, wants to be two amoebas and you want to go where life is good and sort of you got conversion and metastasis. And so just to, just to say that we've, we've tested this. And so one thing you can do is you can kickstart uh, uh, basically full on, for example, full on metastatic melanoma in a tadpole, no carcinogens, no DNA damage, no oncogenes, just by disrupting the electrical state of a certain set of cells. And they just, these, these so, so melanocytes completely convert and they go crazy and take over um, the animal. You can go in the opposite direction and you can put in really nasty oncogenes like human KRAS mutations that make tumors in these animals. And if you at the same time, very carefully manage the electrical state using optogenetics or injective channels, right? You will prevent tumorigenesis despite the fact that the, that the mutation is still there. The oncogene is blazingly expressed. There can be no tumor because you've, you force those cells into their electrical connection. So that, that, that informational boundary, that computational surface between, between you know, the, the boundary of that self and the rest of the world is what sort of shrinks and grows both during development and evolution and cancer. Cannot help but notice the similarity with social, the fragmentation of social identities in modern life. Athena, over to you. Yeah. Okay. So I'm just like super excited listening to you talk about this, Michael, because it really implies that there's a whole other level of health that people don't think about. You know, they talk about physical health and mental health and emotional health, but how about like informational computational health, right? Like having your, the cells of your body, um, having proper electrical signaling, being in the right expression state. I, I mean, I feel like that is, it is mechanistically a unique piece of health and it's something that people aren't talking about as a piece of health in and of itself what you just described michael is so evocative of, of a, a situation where how people behave depends on their social identities and if they have a large social identity then that that functions well and if their social identity shrinks then they just carry on what they're doing it's just a different us it's a different them and of course that could play havoc at larger, um, at larger scales. So do you see that parallelism? I mean, it's so striking to me. I, I see it. I think that um, we have to be careful exactly what you said earlier, which is that there are larger scale structures that you can be part of that are, you know, morally abhorrent and not really um, what we what we want to aim for. So, so the real question is, you know, uh, being part of a larger structure uh, tends to raise your overall IQ. Uh, the question is, what are going to be the goals of these large scale structures? And in general, this is one of the one of the things that I talk about when, you know, about, but when we do this synthetic biology, we make xenobots and people want to know about, you know, when they're going to be cleaning out your arteries and cleaning up the ocean, whatever. That's fine. There will be like specific um, um, applications. But the bigger issue to me, the much bigger issue is to get started working on a science, which we don't yet have of figuring out where the goals of collective systems come from and how do we manage them? Because we're not good at seeing them you know, in advance. We're gonna be surrounded by swarm robotics and the internet of things and all these structures and including current social structures that, have, that literally have their own goals that they're going to be trying to implement. We don't know what those are. We don't know how to envision them. We don't know how to predict them and we don't know how to manage them. And um, getting a handle on that, I think is, is super critical because we, the, these are highly nonlinear emergent surprising processes. We are not good at seeing them coming. Yeah, that resonates a lot. I mean, I think, you know, we have a tendency as humans to be like, here's the thing, like thing, this is the goal. I'm going to put my finger on it. It exists here or there. But when it comes to these emergent systems, you know, the goal does not exist in one place. You can't localize it in, in one entity. Um, and I think we are really bad at 
reasoning about that. And that leads to some serious vulnerabilities for us as a society, especially as things get more and more complex and there are more and more opportunities for these emergent kinds of goals to come about. Yeah, so I want to I want to uh, raise the issue of um, evolutionary processes that give rise to evo other evolutionary processes, and evolution as being something that could be intragenerational. In other words, taking place within an organiza a single organism, in addition to intergenerational. We have some well known examples. Uh, the adaptive component of the immune system is the best known example: the rapid evolution of antibodies. Um, I do a lot of work thinking of our behavioral system as an intragenerational process, what B.F. Skinner calls selection by consequences. But there's more, and I think the more mechanistic you get, then the more Darwinian processes, intragenerational Darwinian processes uh, exist. And so I just wondered if you could add to that list of, of basically uh, Darwinian processes that take place uh, within the organism, in addition to the adaptive component of the immune system and our behavioral flexibility. Cancer is the one that comes to mind. You know, you have cells that are evolving, you know, within the body to, um, you know, they sort of develop their own fitness function, you could say. That's one that's unregulated. So that's an unregulated um, intergenerational, yeah. Yeah, you know, it's unregulated, although there are some really interesting um, ideas now. So if you look at, um, you know, there's certain kinds of mutations like notch mutations where you'll often see a, an expanse um, that takes up uh, a areas where there's sort of been injury. Um, and uh, me and, and Carlo Mela, we have a hypothesis that some of these like um, these clonal expansions in some places might actually be almost like a plan B for um, uh, if you have a wound and um, you need to have a, a mutation um, that will lead to rapid expansion of a cell of you know a cell clone that isn't likely to progress to cancer so that it doesn't get taken up by one that might be um, more out of control. So, you know, there are hypotheses out there that, you know, some aspects of somatic evolution might actually um, be sort of under some control in order to sort of crowd out those processes that are less under control. Um, I think it's a, it's a really exciting venue for, you know, for new work, but there's, you know, because there definitely are um, some clonal expansions that, are much less likely to lead to cancer than others. So it, it could very well be that there's um, some level of you know control there that uh, you know flips um, some of those switches to to just get the clonal expansion and migration without um, necessarily increasing overall cancer risk that much. Yeah, I'm not sure I have any good um, examples of of uh, new uh, phenomena like that. Although I have one that, that I can tell you that's kind of fun that sounds like that, but I actually think isn't at all. And I think that's important. What I what I do like about um, this this kind of uh, this 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 um, idea of uh, of looking for uh, for evolution within the organism is just more broadly, you know, uh, one one thing I'm really interested in in this aspect of ontogeny, recapitulating phylogeny in the journey across the Cartesian cut, right? We all start life as one cell and people like to look at this one cell as um, a, a piece of, it's a, it's a piece of physics and it, you know, it's kind of um, uh, this, this, uh, this, this physical analog system. And then at some point it becomes, a, at least in some cases, let's say, let's say human or, or similar, it becomes this, 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 this novel creature that has cognition, uh, first person perspective and all that. We all got there as a very smooth, um, in a very smooth, continuous way, the same th the same way that evolution got us there from single cells all the way, you know, all the way to 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 more complex forms. And so, I really like this this idea of of trying to understand what what are again what are the invariants in this in this journey, right? And there's in the fact that there's no in both cases there is no what I think is instructive in both cases is there's no one place where biology says draw a sharp line here. Everything before that was just physics. After that, ah, now you have computation, representation, uh, you know, true preferences, you know, like true motivation, all that. There's, there's nowhere that you can draw a sharp line, right? But neither in evolution nor in, in development. And so, so I, 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 I'm interested in asking, you know, what, what aspects of uh, that kind of scaling and um, what just, just what, what, what processes uh, operate at, at the very large scale and then at the very small scale to allow that kind of 
you know, that kind of journey to take, to take place, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So uh, I want to talk a little bit more about um, uh, cancer uh, defenses, uh, the mechanisms that evolve to prevent uh, uh, cancer, which is extensive. And I guess they just shade into the immune system, which also protects against external infectious um, agents. And, um, and uh, uh, so let's talk about uh, that defenses, basically, presumably they evolved by individual level selection, organisms that had these defenses um, um, survived and reproduced better than those that didn't, at least are the just fascinating conjecture, um, Athena, that I just love as part of your work, that um, it's in long lived organisms that cancer def defensive mechanisms are needed the most. And so if we want to find species where cancer um, defense is exceptionally good, we should go to the whales and the elephants, um, not the mice. <laughs> and, uh, and so this kind, this kind of opens up a kind of a cross species comparison of cancer, which did not exist for cancer research for the most part, but now does. So, um, so let's talk about um, the elaborate defenses against cancer that have evolved. And of course, the need to have something similar for a large scale human society. So, uh, so uh, speak to us a little bit about that, Athena. Yeah, well, one of the things to me that is really awesome about cancer defense mechanisms is that they exist on many different levels. So you you have basically, you know, cell intrinsic mechanisms, so things that are inside the cell, you know, encoded into the DNA of the cell that regulate the cell's behavior. So, for example, um, the gene uh, TP53, which is essentially like an information processing hub. So, so Michael, to kind of connect to your work a little bit, I mean, this isn't electrical signaling or electrical information. It's, you know, mostly gene products, but essentially what this, you know, hub is doing is like listening in on all of these activities that are going on inside the cell. You know, what's its metabolism like? What's, um, you know, the cell, what's going on with the cell cycle? Um, how is it, uh, you know, what other thing, what other proteins is it producing? So it's like listening in on everything. And then it is essentially deciding, you know, is this cell um, behaving as it should for being a part of a multicellular organism in this particular spot? Um, and if the answer is no, then it, you know, basically um, initiates this repair, you know, DNA repair process. If that fails, then it initiates apoptosis, you know, cellular self-destruction. So you have this, you know, internal process. Um, cell intrinsic, almost like the cellular conscience, you could think of it that way. Um, and then you have the neighborhood processes. So all of the cells, uh, you know, as Michael was talking about earlier, they're connected to the cells nearby them, sometimes, you know, directly through these junctions where they're sharing, um, you know, proteins and gene products and signaling, you know, electrically, um, and sometimes just because they're near enough by that the, um, you know, uh, factors that are being produced are, you know, um, in this sort of milieu and they're, they're all affecting each other. So um, basically cells are, constantly monitoring their neighbors. I mean, they're like the nosiest neighbors you've ever had. I mean, they're like in your house, that nosy, you know? Um, and 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 cells cells will not they they will not stay alive unless their neighbors are saying stay alive. Um, so they not only do they, you know, require um, like not having apoptosis signals, right? Like it's not that their neighbors, so if their neighbors say die, they die just like that. But they also, they're also listening like, do my neighbors want me alive? And if their neighbors, they're not getting those signals from their neighbors, then they self-destruct. So they're like, they're like, you know, super, super sensitive to their social environment, you could say. And um, everybody, you know, all of the cells have these nosy neighbors. So, so you have intrinsic, then you have these neighborhood level um, functions, and then you have the systemic level. So the, the immune system. And so the, you know, immune cells are like monitoring the whole body for like regions where it seems like something is a little off. Like, you know, are there, does it seem like maybe there's cells that are replicating that shouldn't? Is there, you know, some sort of, you know, chronic situation that's, that, that just seems a little bit off. And if so, then, you know, the immune cells will go to that region and try to 
you know, probably, Michael, a lot of what they're doing is trying to re-regulate the signaling. I hadn't really thought about it that way, but, you know, they're probably initially that's what they do. And then if that doesn't work, that's probably when they go into sort of the apoptosis mode. Um, but yeah, I wonder if people have looked for that, actually, like looked at the immune system as, uh, you know, information, electrical signal regulating system in its first pass, because that would be way less costly than all the cellular destruction that we usually associate with what the immune system is doing. Yeah, there, there is there is some work on that on macrophages and things uh, things of that nature. Um, yeah, this is this is great. I love I love the the, the story you just told. And uh, uh, but the only thing I can add to that is uh, my my favorite cancer suppression uh, story, which is that apparently one of the best ways to suppress cancer is to have a really strong idea of what you should be doing instead, a really strong morphogenetic cascade. And uh, there, there was, it, it's, it's, it's really interesting. If you have a view, which is, which was maybe probably still is, but, but it's, I think it's kind of crumbling this, this view of cancer as, um, very sort of local, uh, you know, um, uh, checkpoint genes and, and suppression mechanisms and so on. You would predict that animals that have a very large, that have access to a very large pool of undifferentiated plastic cells, basically regenerators, that they should have very, um, they should be very prone to cancer. And in fact, it's been said that the reason that, that let's say humans are, are poor regenerators is in order to avoid the kind of uh, oncogenic risk that you would get from having cells that are just happy to proliferate and you know and migrate and things like that. So that would be the prediction, right? And and. Uh, on the other hand, if you have this idea that cancer is an escape from a, a strong morphogenetic memory of the network, you would say that, no, actually, um, you, would, you would predict that good regenerators should have very low incidences of cancer. So that's nice because it's a case where these two theories make opposite predictions, and that's been checked. And regenerators, good regenerators, in fact, have very, very low incidences of cancer. Having, having lots of plastic proliferative cells is no problem if you have the information structure that harnesses them towards a, an adaptive outcome. And so my favorite example of that is planaria. So these planarian flatworms, here's a couple of things about them. They are incredibly regenerative, so you can cut them into pieces. The record, I think, is like 275 pieces, something like that. And Thomas Hunt Morgan in you know, 1903 or, or something uh, cut them into you know, a couple of hundred pieces, and every piece knows exactly what a correct worm looks like. Um, they, they regenerate with, with incredible fidelity. They make the worm okay. They don't, they don't get cancer. Uh, now the 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 other is, so so they've so now now a couple of things a they've solved the aging problem so there's no such thing as an old planarian they don't age and so they are basically immortal and so the worms that I have in my lab are in direct physical continuity with worms that were here almost half a billion years ago like these are them now what they do do in 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 order to proliferate um, many of them can do sexual reproduction but they usually don't what they do is they tear themselves in half and then each half regrows the other half and now you've got two worms okay. Now think about what this means from the perspective of um, uh, inheritance. They they have uh, they they basically don't have a Weismann's barrier because any mutation in the body in the somatic uh, they, they have somatic inheritance. Any mutation that doesn't kill a stem cell is inherited and re replicated throughout the body once they divide, and that cell has to make more progeny to fill in the rest of the body. Right. So now for several hundred million years they've been accumulating all these mutations, their genomes are an incredible mess. We don't even have a proper assembly in, in Japonica because the cells are mixoploid. Every cell has a different number of chromosomes. You don't even know what you're sequencing because, because every cell is just mass, right? Yeah, massive genomic diversity. They are champion regenerators. Their anatomy is rock solid every single time, exactly correct. Now think about what this means for our claim to understand what, what the relationship between genomes and anatomy is. We, we don't have a clue here really because, because the genome is basically shot to hell. It's all over the place. Every cell has a different genome. If you were to say, you know, how, how genetically related they are, I mean, I don't even know how you estimate that because they have all kinds of you know, mosaicism within a single animal. And yet their anatomy is the, is the strongest of any other species, best controlled. So to me, to me, you know, this, this tells us something very important that, that having genomic uh, differences, genomic errors, that's not really primary. If you really want to defend against cancer, you should have the same type of large scale um, instructive pattern memories in, 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 you know, in, in stored uh, biochemically, bioelectrically, biomechanically, whatever it's going to be uh, really uh, strong so that any cell 
that has uh, even, even, you know, even an inkling of trying to do something different is overcome with this connection, with this functional connection to a collective that's trying to maintain organs, tissues, and, and so on. So that's, that's my favorite suppression story. Michael, this seems like it has huge implications for thinking about resilience broadly, right? I mean, I think that there's a sort of bias that many of us have thinking that, well, you know, if you want to have a system that is robust and can, you know, be replicate order and all of that, that the system itself has to be highly ordered and structured and that like you have to be able to sort of see, you know, how that that order gets created. Like it's almost like, you know, a sort of bureaucratic mindset about being resilient. But um, it seems like very often the systems that are most resilient are the ones that actually, you know, go through challenges and then have to, you know, change what they're doing or add these layers or add this other component. Um, and, you know, often what you end up with is something that's a total kludge. Um, but that might be much better at being resilient than something that, you know, looks like it has a structure that you could be like, oh, I see how that would do this and this and this, and that would lead to, you know, what the expected outcome is. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, so um, let me give some human examples and we can segue to our final segment about what all this means for um, for the um, uh, future of humanity and the internet uh, internet age. But when you were talking about nosy neighbor uh, selves, Athena, I was reminded of um, uh, Jainism, which is one of the strongest and oldest religions uh, in India. And uh, the Jains have ascetics. So basically, they um, um, uh, wander. They don't. Uh, 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 they wander from house to house, and they and they are fed by the households. But they operate in that capacity as the nosy neighbor. Uh, their food restrictions are so great that they can't accept food unless it's unless it's pure, from their standpoints. And so they'll inspect the entire household before they'll accept a morsel of food. And um, and they also uh, sharply question the occupants of the house and so on to see that they're good, upstanding Jains. And if they're not, and if they leave without food, then the whole community sees that. And so so this is actually a kind of a moral policing. Seems a little immune system like almost. Very much so. And then uh, also one of my favorite episodes in this series is with uh, Anne Klin, who is um a senior member of the um, volunteer workforce of Wikipedia. And we have a whole episode on how Wikipedia works as well as it does. And it's all of these checks and balances and protections against cheating coordination. I mean, it's so reminiscent of our conversation. And um, in my conversation with Ann, I said, Ann, this, this looks like the immune system. Do you actually talk of it that way? Do you actually use the metaphor of the immune system over there at Wikipedia? And she said, oh yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, you know, I mean, it's needed. Something like this is needed for any form of higher level functional organization, be it a cell, a multicellular organism, or a well-functioning human society such as Wikipedia. And so with that, let's talk about what does all this mean? What uh, thinking have you done on modern human society? It's electronically uh uh, connected. And uh, so electronic communication, not only does it apply to nervous systems, but as we've seen in this conversation way, way before. Um, so what, what, what are your thoughts on, on, uh, on uh, just the idea of human cooperation, which of course does take place at, at uh, impressively large scales, scales that were unimaginable uh, even a few thousand years ago, even a few hundred years ago, the, the concept of global cooperation was beyond the imagination, I think, uh, before several centuries uh, ago. Now it's something which not only does it make sense, but it's the only thing that makes sense. And we can, many people at least can appreciate that um, the need for a whole earth ethic, that's, the, that's what needs to work well. And everything underneath it needs to be coordinated. So what do you think of all this? How do you apply these ideas to, to what Tehard would have called the omega point or this some kind of the prospects for some kind of global consciousness? Is it possible? Uh, um, I think we can agree it's not inevitable. Uh, so what are your thoughts on, 
on all of those things? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, I think that the big challenge is a scaling issue. So, we, you know, when we go from small scale societies to larger scale societies, if we look at how small scale societies, you know, regulate cooperation and also how they sort of have resilience built into almost their cultural DNA, you know, we see these systems that are basically, we call them need based transfer systems where people will help each other if they have the resources to help um, and if someone is in need. So, you know, many of them still have like, you know, I, this, this is mine and this is yours, you know, these cows are mine and these are yours. But if um, things get really bad and you need something, like I will help you and I will give you a gift that, you know, and I won't expect you to pay me back. And th those kinds of systems, you know, we see across lots of small scale societies. And, um, you know, from the Maasai in East Africa, they call it Osotwa to, you know, Fijians that live, you know, and that fish and do horticulture um, in, you know, the Fijian islands. Um, they have a system called Kerry Kerry, same thing. It's this need-based transfer system. Um, now, when you start trying to scale up a need-based transfer system, though, it can, can get more challenging. So um, I think the best example we have from small-scale societies is actually in Fiji, where um, oftentimes a whole village will get hit um, by a cyclone. And um, what this means is that villages will actually have relationships with each other that are sort of dyadic village-village relationships of this, um, you know, uh, this need-based transfer um, norm. So they will help, you know, one village will help a whole other village if they're hit, because within the village, people can't help each other. Athena, I want to nail down a point that you made earlier. There has to be a history of this kind of thing happening for there to be adaptations to to um, uh, to address it. So a whole village um, um, uh, destruction like that, that had to have happened for this kind of arrangement to have evolved. In a constant environment, would that never happen? Why would you expect a solution to it? So so these are all called for by the, uh, so uh, I just wanted to make that point. Now continue, please. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and the, you know, the scale of the disasters and the challenges is super important here. It's like, you know, you want to have systems where the risk is um, being shared at scales where there is um, variation in the likelihood of being hit, right? So it's like, you know, it, because cyclones are sort of often narrow things, um, it's likely that one village, um, you know, will, if the one village is hit very, very hard, a neighboring village probably won't be hit as hard. Um, but if you have, you know, destructive events that are much larger in scale, um, then you have to think, okay, well, what is the appropriate scale then for these risk sharing arrangements? And, you know, I think as, as society has scaled up, um, there was never any sort of conscious effort towards taking these kinds of risk management systems and scaling them up because um, a lot of the economic growth um, which fuels itself, of course, you know, is based on how you make the most efficient transactions where you get the most benefit for the least cost. And, you know, there are a lot of things that capitalism works great for, including short term efficiency. But what it doesn't do well is create systems where risk is being effectively managed on long temporal and, and large spatial scales. So I see this as sort of the critical issue for us, um, you know, as a society today, how do we grapple with the risk that we're facing locally, regionally, you know, and, uh, you know, on larger, on larger scales, and then create the kinds of risk sharing systems that have served our species so well for so long, um, and translate that into something that makes sense for our global society. And I have a feeling it'll probably be some hybrid, you know, between um, need-based transfer type principles and more account keeping based principles, just because account keeping principles are so pervasive and they work for a lot of the things that, you know, we need to happen in our society. Um, but I think we do need to, to think very um, explicitly about how do we import um, some of these, um, these, these systems. And, and, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of things to draw from in terms of, you know, like, we already have a very developed insurance industry. Um, I think insurance industries, you know, they're also sort of grappling with how to deal with increasing risk that um, and the increasing sort of um, entwinement of risk that, you know, characterize our global society. So I, I don't know, I have hope that 
that there's a realization that there are many many problems here that maybe we can solve with a with a solution that incorporates some of these um, these risk sharing principles. That's great, Athena. Thank you, Michael. Your turn, and then I'll take my turn. Well, um, two things I wanted to say. One, one is um, if we go back to this idea that. Uh, one of the central things that define a given um, agent, um, whether it be human or, or something smaller, is that is the scale of their goals. Then what we find is that uh, humans are in a very unique position. If you are, let's say, a goldfish, and let's say you have a, 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 a cognitive horizon of, of 30 minutes, right? So all your goals, you know, you're not, you don't have any goals that are longer than 30 minutes long, let's say, just for the sake of argument then one of the things that is true, and I think it's true for most organisms, is that your lifespan is actually longer than that horizon, meaning that all of your goals are in fact achievable during your lifetime. Humans are perhaps uniquely in the position where your goals temporally and spatially could be enormous, and, and many of them are absolutely not going to be achievable during your lifetime because, because your goals are now bigger than the whatever, you know, roughly 100 years that, that, that we have. And I have a feeling that this gives rise to a lot of unique um, uh, sort of uh, issues in the realm of psychology and psychiatry that sit at the root of this, of this situation where for the, first, uh, for the first time, you now have a set of stressors, and that's a whole other, actually stress is a whole other thing we could talk about. You now have a set of stressors about certain goals that are guaranteed to not be achievable because you know that you have this, this smaller horizon of action. So that, that I think puts a lot of pressure on, um, on, on our activities. Uh, the, other, the other thing that I'll just mention is um, I, I was once in a discussion with someone, um, I think it was a podcast interview, and I, I got done talking about basically trying to deconstruct a lot of these binary categories because someone was saying, you know, human this and human that. And I said, look, first evolution wise, I don't, you know, it's, it's very smooth all the way back. I'm not even sure what we exactly we're talking about. And then in terms of um, modern hybridization, so you could have a creature that's, you know, 85% human brain, 15% percent implanted technology and you can have any percentage that you want right so all of this these are not binary categories and 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 so after all of this and trying to explain all the varieties that you would have a hard time saying if this was a human or not he said okay well then what is a human then then, then what is that anyway what what's a human anyway right and i i think it's a really good question and i think what we can't rely on are our, our um, criteria based on what exactly you're made of, so what components are in there, or how you got here, what percentage. No, yeah, I don't think it's. Re I think it's ridiculous to draw a line and say if you've got at least you know 92 percent of of things that were evolved in the human lineage and the rest are technology. Well, then you're a human. I, I don't think that flies. So if we have to come up with a um, a more generic, more useful uh, kind of a definition for what a human is to begin with. I think going back to this, you know, my, my sort of um, focus on on, uh, on on goals and air and things you're concerned about, you know, what are what are the things that you're actually actively trying to achieve? I think that probably what a human needs to be is the definition of a minimal cognitive horizon that is uh, has a has a has a minimal radius of compassion outwards. So I think, and this is this is this is very compatible with um, with, with ideas in in, um, in Buddhist thought and in other types of um, uh, other traditions where the point isn't the, what you're made of. The point is how much care can you muster about the other intelligences and the other uh, sentient beings around you. So if if I had to define what a human is, I wouldn't talk about um, brain structure or or you know time since uh, speciation or any of that stuff. I would be looking at the set of uh, w w what does your cognitive structure allow you to have as goals that are large enough that comprise other sentient beings. And if it's big enough that, a, you know, if it's bigger than a certain minimal level, which I, I'm not going to be the one to set that level, obviously, but, but bigger than, than a particular radius, then you are a fully fledged human, uh, no matter what you're made of or how you got here. And uh, then we can very comfortably talk about things like uh, diminished capacity where, okay, something happened and you're not in fact able to care about the welfare of the standard number of things that a human should be. And so in court, certain things will happen. And it also lets us think about what I think is inevitable, which is the eventual appearance of creatures that have greater than human cognitive horizons that may have, in fact, greater moral responsibility because they actually can 
they physically can care about more things that a standard issue human can care about. And again, there are traditions that talk about that, right? Expansion of consciousness to the point where you are actively able to care about the well-being of a large number of sentient creatures that a normal person just can't, you know, you, you just can't physically muster that in the linear range of, of, of what you can, you can um, actively care about. And uh, so, so that's, you know, so, so those are the kinds of things that I think about is, you know, how do we define humans in terms of in terms of both moral responsibility and in fact responsibility to these various different kind of creatures based on um, outward facing uh, goals and what it is that uh, that they can care about with respect to other sentient beings. Wow. Okay. Well, okay. So I have a bit of wrap up to do here. Uh, I want to make a connection with another episode with uh, Jim Cohen and Gary Sternberg. Back to small scale society and what uh, Jim Cohen calls social baseline theory, which is, or which takes note, that um, humans never lived alone. They always lived in the context of uh, cooperative groups, even when those groups were warring with other groups. And as a result of that, uh, genetic evolution um, has uh, basically baked into our brains and bodies. Uh, uh, social resources in addition to personal resources, that when our brains and bodies make their myriad trade-off decisions, most of which are beneath consciousness, they're always factoring in social resources in addition to personal resources. And in that sense, we are members of colonies like an ant in a colony, much more so than we have thought, uh, especially during the age of individualism, which is the last 70, um, 70 years. So. Um, so uh, there's a really interesting connection there. And then another point I want to make, a major point, is that there's two very different mindsets for thinking about being part of something larger than oneself. One has a very negative valence, like we're all in the matrix, or we're all going to be skin cells, or we're all members of totalitarian regimes. And But then there's a mindset with a highly positive valence, which is basically the religious and spiritual mindset of being part of something larger than ourselves and wanting to be part of something larger than ourselves. And um, and it's at that point that you're more joyful, basically, in becoming part of this. This ex describes so many people's wartime experiences where you're so bonded to your fighting unit that you'll live and, uh, willingly die uh, uh, for it, where you can take a long-term goal that's longer than your lifetime. We're equipped to do that. It happens all the time. So um, I think, isn't it interesting? And of course, it all boils down to whether the individual perceives this that being part of something larger than themselves as, as benign or not for themselves. And and when they when they think it's benign, then it's something that they willingly do. And it's it's probably the optimal human experience is to be is to be part of something larger than yourself. And at a more mundane level, I think, I'm speaking of it in high spiritual terms, back to my interview with Ann Klin on, on Wikipedia, why is that so engaging for the, you know, the hundreds and thousands of people that, that just love working on a volunteer basis for Wikipedia? Well, it's because it's a pro-social cause. Wikipedia is doing you know, such wonderful work if you join it, and you get to interact with like-minded People, it's just so very, so very fulfilling. They love becoming part of something larger than themselves, and they'll spend all of their discretionary time doing it. So there is this positive face. Athena, you want to chip in on this? Yeah, anyway? I want to just emphasize that point. You know, I think that we have a deep desire to contribute, um, to be a part of something, and you know. Many um, years ago, right, I, I worked on this idea of the walk away strategy, like, you know, you're, you're in a group and you leave if there isn't sufficient cooperation. Well, I think there's another piece that's very similar um, in terms of the mechanism, but it's, it's kind of the opposite. Like, you will leave a group if you feel like you don't have an opportunity to contribute or if your con contribution isn't valued. And I think that is a really deep desire that we as humans have is to be a part of something where we are contributing to make it better, um, at least for most humans. And um, that I think is kind of, you know, often not really acknowledged as a, you know, deep and legitimate human drive. But I, I think it's there. And Wikipedia is such a great example of that. And I think that um, that when it comes to the the scale of our social 
identities, kind of the scale of our compassion, which Michael, you were talking about, there's such flexibility there because so many of our groups are socially constructed, almost all of them, then the identity is that flexible. We could regard ourselves as, as citizens of our nations or our religions or our small groups. Why not the whole earth? In fact, there's no, no more stretch of the imagination to consider ourselves first and foremost human beings and citizens of the world than first and foremost Democrats or, or Republicans. They're all social, uh, social constructions. But then comes, of course, to what actually we do on that basis and how those things compete with other forms of behavior. At the end of the day, it comes down to a form of cultural selection, which needs to be itself culturally, uh, uh, culturally uh, constructed. So for that half full glass with the blind component and the intentional component of cultural evolution needs to become more intentional than ever before and it needs to be experimental because we don't know what the consequences of our actions are. Really, all we can do is make informed guesses. Then we have to experiment again and again and again. And then we have to be mindful about what we're trying to accomplish and then selecting the things that get us in that direction. So it ends up being a essentially an intentional form of cultural evolution with the welfare of the whole system in mind and everything underneath that being appropriately coordinated. It's basically a managed process of cultural evolution at the global scale is what is needed and nothing less will do is the way I frame it. So uh, uh, please share your thoughts. You know, let's have a wrap up session. And then uh, this has been such a wonderful addition to our uh, series on the science of the noosphere. Uh, Athena, you want to go first and then Michael? Well, I think that, you know, this whole question of, how, you know, what what do we need to do in terms of sort of cultural infrastructure to help us be more resilient is really the the question um, and the problem of our generation. And, you know, if we kind of just assume, well, you know, the tech billionaires will figure out how to solve it with, uh, you know, technology and money and, um, you know, becoming interplanetary or whatever, then I think, you know, we kind of lost a lot of our autonomy to create the kinds of systems that we want that not only will help us be more resilient on a really large scale level, but also will help to sort of, you know, feed us as humans that need to be embedded in social environments where, you know, we do feel like um, we have a safety net. And I think that's a really, it's a really fundamental thing um, that we that we have um, really built into our evolutionary heritage. Because you know, humans that were not embedded in social environments where they had safety nets were not as likely to make it, you know, than as those who did. Let alone, you know, societies that had cultural structures that had those safety nets. Um, you know, those were much more likely to do well in the, you know, sort of cultural evolution stage. So I think that, you know, thinking about how can we make that um, transition and be intentional about the structures that we're, we're you know, introducing on, um, you know, these regional global levels that, you know, and think about sort of the scales and have a a structure where you have multiple you're, you have multiple levels um, that solve the problems that are at those different levels. Um, you know, using some principles, kind of like you know some of these principles from Ostrom and some of these principles from small scale societies that use need based transfers. I think uh, could be really great, and I'd love to see a, a more sort of purposeful um, discussion about how do we implement or at least test out you know some of these strategies on a larger scale because we don't necessarily want to say okay here's the one solution now everybody just needs to do this right you want to like say okay here well we could try this out at a higher scale here um you know with these partners and then see how it goes so so that's what i would like to see well um here's what i'd like to see as well this is this is kind of my my wish list um what 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 i think uh we need of, to optimize that relationship between our individual agency and the benefits of, of belonging to various large-scale structures is the ability to uh, have some inkling into what the goals of the structure are so we can choose which ones we join. So I think, I think a huge limitation on our agency is that we join things having absolutely no idea 
what our contribution to them is going to lead to, what this, what the group is doing. It used to be easy. You could look and you could say, okay, I could be part of uh, part of these folks doing what they do, or I could be part of these folks doing what they do. That that it is now almost impossible to know all of the choices that you make in terms of what you uh, consume online, what kind of products you interact with, what groups you you uh, hang around with. Um, extremely difficult to know what the what the end result of all of that is going to be. So I look forward to a future where we have tools, uh, initially con conceptual apparatus, because this doesn't exist yet. So this needs to be developed. And ultimately, some sort of tool, whether that be some some AI type of visualizer or something that enables you to make better informed choices about which kinds of things you want to be a part of. And uh, and this means not just the kind of the obvious stuff. I mean, all of us make choices about what groups we join that, that kind, that's kind of obvious, but all of the um, really developing a science of predicting uh, the goals and the uh, uh, cognitive capacities of large scale kinds of systems that we are terrible at recognizing as large agents. We don't understand ways in which they're going to deform our action space. Um, all of these things that are that are very hard to predict and completely not obvious. So, so that's what I look forward to. I look forward to all of us subunits uh, having, having choice about um, what larger uh, thing we're going to be a part of. So this has been an amazing conversation, a wonderful addition to our Science of the Noosphere uh, uh, series, and a wonderful affirmation of the fact that when we tell this story, um, we need to include the entire arc from really the origin of life all the way up to the internet age. And this, uh, this level that we've been dwelling on of the single cell and multicellularity, so informative. Who would have known? I think that, I think that Almost everyone who listens to this is just going to be amazed at what we've been covering and its relevance to to um, our current uh, our current moment in human uh, cultural evolution. So thank you so much, and um, and uh, I had a great time. Thank you so much. Time, I did too. Yeah, great great conversation. Thank you.